Coming up, I get to grips with a steering wheel. I play some games. And I chat to Jeff. Let's get on then. Now this feature kind of links into two sections of the show. Not only is it a feature in its own right, but it also includes a game. And this. Nigel Mansell was a British racing driver, competing in both Formula 1 and Kart IndyCar World Series. His Formula 1 years, 15 of them, saw him win in 1992, and is currently the second most successful British Formula 1 driver behind Lewis Hamilton, which also puts him 8th in the world. During his career, he drove for Lotus, Williams and Ferrari, a British driving hero, so there was no doubt that a game would come along soon. In fact, many games for many different platforms. Nigel Mansell has given his name to many things, and many games across many systems, but is there anything more cheaply made than this? This is the Freewheel, made by Logic 3, and released around 1992 to 1993. I have found a few references to it, mainly special reserve adverts, but a few full page adverts in other magazines for other 8 bit consoles. It sold for around £30 to £39 depending on the date and which console it was for. This one was designed for micros, and the box claims it will work for many systems, including the Spectrum. There's a pictorial representation of how it works. Mercury switches allow left and right steering, as well as tilting forwards and backwards to accelerate and brake. There are also some buttons, assuming they're fire buttons. Inside we get, well, the steering wheel. It's Kempston compatible, so should work with plenty of games. It feels light, and a little bit cheap to be honest. The buttons almost feel like they will break if I press them too hard. I will try this out on normal games in a little while, but first let's try it out for the game it was designed for, Nigel Mansell's Grand Prix. This was released by Martek, in 1987. The first problem I came across was that it wouldn't work with the Div MMC for some reason. A normal joystick would, like the Cheetah 125 for example, and this gave the correct results when using the IN31 command. However, plugging in the steering wheel got totally different numbers. I thought it was broken, but then decided to try a real Kempston joystick interface, and that worked properly. So, switching to the smart card for fast loading, we can at last play the game. You still need the keyboard to enter your name and select the options, but once into the game, in this case the practice session, and the steering wheel worked, sort of. You tilt forward to accelerate and tilt back to brake, and left and right to steer the car. The buttons in this game are used to change gear. Changing gear was tricky. Moving up is fine, you just accelerate and press the fire button when the revs are about right. However, to change down, you have to be not accelerating or braking, meaning you have to get the joystick perfectly vertical. It can be done, but it's very cumbersome. Because the wheel is only emulating a digital joystick, there's no real feeling of driving, to be honest. At least, not like using an analog control. You end up jerking the wheel left and right, forwards and backwards, which doesn't give the right feeling at all. In fact, it made the game somehow feel worse than it was. I don't think I could continue using this to review this game, because it's just not right and I don't think it works well enough. But anyway, moving on, for a bit of fun, let's try some other games. How about Manic Miner? Well, you can play it, sort of. And jetpack. Oh dear, now this is very tricky, but again, just about playable. That run seemed to work better, probably because it was slower and the track was wider.
I think this needs to go back in the box and tucked away in a dark corner somewhere. I can see what they were trying to do, but, well, looking at it and using it as an adult, it doesn't match my expectations. So, ditching the wheel, let's play the game properly then. The game allows you to practice or enter short races with a number of laps, or you can even do a full Grand Prix season. Luckily, you can save your progress, as this is not a quick game if you play it properly. The inlay and advert goes into overdrive, claiming to be the first racing simulation to reflect some of the enormous advances in car design. Okay. The inlay shows a screenshot of probably the Amiga or Atari version, which usually means the Spectrum version is not going to be that good. There are two flavours of the game, 48 and 128K. Let's start with a 48K version then. Upon loading, you get a dashboard and some options, including the ability to load a safe position. Let's start with a 5 lap Grand Prix. You enter your name, and a track is loaded. When competing, you first have to qualify, and this means 4 laps of the track. The first one is just to get up to speed, and then the 3 remaining laps are timed. This will then, if you manage to complete it without breaking your car, put you somewhere on the starting grid. Now the race begins. A countdown and into the game. The tracks, of which there are 16, have very little roadside scenery to give that feeling of speed. The horizon does move, but the car only has a few frames of animation when turning. Tracks include famous names like Monaco, Silverstone, Hockenheim and Monza. Initially, I found myself a bit bored to be honest, and I never qualified. I always ended up wrecking the gearbox. After a few more attempts though, I got the hang of it and got onto the starting grid. And the game started to grow on me. The graphics, as you can see, are monochrome and change with each track. Lack of scenery, apart from the horizon, means that the tracks all look the same, though. The dashboard gives you various readings, including temperatures, speed and lap times, and you get messages from the pit about position and nearby cars. The track is quite narrow, meaning overtaking or manoeuvring so you don't hit an opponent can be difficult. The additional cars give both extra excitement and frustration at the same time, depending on how they move, sometimes blocking you in, sometimes giving you just enough room to get past. Practice and qualifying has very few, if any, cars. The game demands that you know the tracks. Using the gears and braking at the right time is essential if you want to progress, and this is a simulation, as the adverts claim. Looking at the RZX playback, the scenery changes very little across other tracks, just a change in colour. You do get trees and buildings on the horizon, but the roadside objects are still missing. This is not a quick arcade racer, so if you're looking for an outrun style game, move on quickly. There was another Nigel Mansell game for the Spectrum, but that's for another day. If you enjoy the simulation aspect of games, getting track knowledge, changing gears, using the driving line, etc., then this is not bad, really. But leave the wheel in the cupboard. This is Scumball, released by Bulldog in 1988. The sewers have been overrun with aliens. Their leader, the Green Slime, is hidden deep underground. You control Linda, which stands for Laser Incorporated Nasty's Disposal Android, and you must locate and kill the green slime. To do this, you have to search for eight grenades, and when you find one, you pick it up and take it back to the green slime's lair and throw it. Only after all eight grenades have been thrown can the game be completed.
getting in your way are many things, as you'd expect. There are aliens of different kinds that roam about and materialise all around Linda. There are tentacles on the floor, drops falling down from the roof and bubbles. Some of the aliens can be shot, but this uses up your laser. You can refill this though by collecting the refill packs marked L. At the top left of the screen are three meters, and these represent S for spares, no mention in any review or instructions what this means, let's assume it's a sort of backup power thing. L for your laser power, and P for your overall power. Your normal power can be replenished in two ways. First by collecting batteries, or if you find an oil can spurting oil, standing on these will also replenish it. There are other collectibles too, one for invulnerability, one for a three-way bomb, and one called ice, which I'm not really sure what it does. The sewers are quite large, with colourful scenery all around. The graphics are really nice and well defined, and move smoothly. The aliens vary in type and size, giving a better feel than everything just being the same. Control is good, with keys and joystick support. Sound is used well too, with various effects that all suit the game. I found at times there was just too many aliens appearing, and in some places you can't avoid colliding with them. Because you can only carry one grenade at a time, which strangely enough looks like a fire extinguisher, the game can take a while to complete, if you manage to keep your power levels up, that is. Obviously you need to learn the map to have a better chance. You can also get a report by pressing the appropriate key, and keys can be redefined. The report will tell you things that in theory will make you want to try again, so for example, how many shots you've used, and you also get an overall rating. The game sadly has an instant death room. If you enter, you'll keep getting killed. No way out, and it's a bad design idea. Very annoying. Difficulty wise, I would say this is troublesome. Having to get back to the green slime for every grenade is, without cheating, almost impossible. Even with the map, avoiding all those nasties and keeping your power up is hard. The layout also makes it harder by placing the green slime that can only be accessed from the very top, so each grenade has to be carried all the way back to the start position and then down a few screens. For $1.99 though, its original price, this is a good game and I enjoyed playing it, although it is tough. It's strange that none of the magazine reviews actually go into the details about what the meters mean, how to replenish your energy, the collection elements, etc, etc. Oh, and on a side note, I rewrote this game in 2003 for the PC. Not a bad game then, and one to try if you like this sort of thing. So this time, Paul, we're going to talk about isometric games, which I love, but I think you've got a bit of mixed feelings about. I have got very mixed feelings, yeah. It starts from way, way back when the first one came out, or, well, that's debatable. Some people think um, All or Nothing. No, or Ant Attack, or All or Nothing from Abex. But uh, we're obviously talking about, or I'm talking about Night Law. When it was released, and I remember when it was released, up until then, the graphics, although very good, were just flat in comparison, but you didn't know that until it came out. And when yeah. when the graphics came on Night Law, it was actually jaw-dropping. It was just stunned. How the hell could this be even possible on a Spectrum? But when I went beyond that, when I went beyond the nice graphics, I just couldn't get the, to grips with the controls and the spatial, whatever it's called. So I thought I was jumping on a block, and I wasn't. I was miles away, and... Yeah, I I quite like Night Law. My, f my favourite, I may as well get this out early, is Alien Ace. Well, which... uh, funnily enough, so is mine. I mean, it's the only one of the... Well, I tried Night Law, and then I got Alien 8, because suddenly said it was much easier to play, and I did find it easier to play. 
they improved it. Night Law was good. Really enjoyed Night Law. Didn't get to play it much. The thing I hated about Night Law, and this wasn't the graphics, was the changing into the wolf mechanic. Because okay. quite often you die. You go into a room, you changed into a wolf, and that would mean you were dead. In fact, there's one room, I think it's game over if that happens. Right. Well, I thought that was uh, an interesting element to the game, but obviously I didn't play it far enough to know that you got instant death with it, or death while you were changing. I thought it was interesting that some other enemies didn't go near you when you were a wolf, or... Somebody, is it right you can jump higher if you're a wolf? I can't remember. No. I've, I've seen that, and I am... Um, I've played it a lot. I can complete it, and still... I've never noticed that you can jump further as the wolf. But the, the other thing is, if you don't keep an eye on the sun and the moon, you know the poor colourses that raise up? Yeah. If you ch- if one raises up, you're walking under it and you change under it, it'll drop down on you and kill you. <laughs> <laughs> there were so many good game mechanics within that 3D environment because you could take things to the next level. You could hide things underneath blocks. You had um, blocks that vanished when you jumped on them, and the thing that I hated most was the the puzzles where you had to jump on a block and change direction, either mid-jump or instantly you land, you have to turn and jump, and I just couldn't get to grips with that. Yeah, I I enjoyed them. The thing is that I always think, I think I think there were two kind of sets of good ones. There was Night Law and Alien Ace, which yeah. were kind of 3D platformers. They were very platformy. Yeah, yeah. And timing jumps right, and, and I mean, literally, if you think back to Manic Mine, and Night Law had collapsing floor. Yeah. And then there was the John Rittman ones, Batman and Head Over Heels, yeah. which were much more puzzle games. Yeah, I think Head Over Heels stood head and shoulders above most of the other, shall I use the word, tat that came out 3D-wise. You know, the, the, the extra puzzle element of only being able to do things in one character. Head Over Heels is very, very puzzly. And the, and the other thing that sort of made things a little bit less shiny for me was when it was released there was then a flood of other games that were the same but they were just yeah. bad imitations of. Yeah, definitely. The Sweebo's World ones seem to be well respected by Gogo. Is that the one where they, you're underwater? You, you can swim around underwater or am I thinking of something else? That's the follow-up Hydra Fool. Ah, oh, right, okay. Because that added, the, obviously that added the water element which yeah. and anything that adds in it to, to improve the game is fine. Fairlight, I think, was also that. That was one I've never played that, but that was one that was really, really seems to have been well received and well respected. Yeah, that that was a slightly different approach. It wasn't, or, and it wasn't the same engine, but the the graphics were, I think, were smaller, and there were puzzle elements in that, and you could actually pick up objects, yeah. and well, you can pick them up in Nightlaw, but you had a a, a purpose for them. Yes. And then, then of course, there was where time stood still. I've never played that. Which, which sort and of extended it to having a large... It wasn't room by room, it was a large large map that scrolled. So are we also going to talk about Nightshade and Gunfright by Ultima? Because Nightshade was dire. <laughs> I, I think when they moved away from the Filmation 1 engine onto Filmation 2 with the scrolling, larger scrolling, I don't know what you want to call it, graphics or scenery, Yeah. Um, I don't think that did it. I mean, I like the graphics. Some of the characters were good when, when you got on the, the horse... And, yep. you, and you ran around and stuff, but then then started throwing other games in. When the, in Gunfright, they had that shooting game, and then you had to shoot other cowboys and things. Yeah. Any other isometric games we we can remember? Movie was supposed to be a good one, wasn't it? Movie and um, Nosferatu the Vampire was on there. Um, I mean, you what, mentioned where time stood still. I think the Great Escape was. That, yeah, and the Great Escape. Kind of its predecessor, wasn't it? What um, about what about Zagzen? 3D shooters, are they coming into it, or are we still talking platform struck puzzle? Was there a good Saxon game on the Spectrum? No. <laughs> <laughs> the, the best one that I've found that, that is actually playable is Hate. And what about yeah. um, Highway Encounter and things like that? Yeah I, was thinking, yeah, I was thinking of Highway Encounter as well. But going back to your original idea of talking about these, is because I couldn't play them. I, I don't know how you manage it. Nightmare's <laughs> not that hard. This is Anti-Air, released by Inofuto in 2024. Inofuto seems to put games out at an astonishing rate, and they're all very good. Here's the new one then, Anti-Air. It's a shooter, 
and a great one too. Shooting the aliens carrying the blue rocks causes them to drop, which then blocks your path. To get rid of them, you can either hope that an alien carrying a green or red bomb will drop it, or you can shoot the alien carrying a green or red bomb and it will drop down in the right place. Green bombs just explode on impact, red bombs sit there for a while before exploding. You do have to be careful not to drop a bomb on yourself. All of the time there is a chance that an alien will drop a bomb unprovoked, so you have to be careful not to get surrounded by blue blocks. Sound and graphics are great and it plays really well. Control is responsive and all in all this is a great game. Anyone remember Frankenstein from PSS back in 1984? A brilliant and fun game. Well, there was meant to be a sequel, but it never got completed, at least until now in 2024. The author of Frankenstein, Colin Stewart, has finally released the follow-up, Dr. Acula. The game shares many elements of the first one, but now there is more, spread over 50 screens. There are jumps, teleports, water, as well as the things from the first game like ice, electric shocks and guns. The timer counts down as you frantically try and complete each screen. Selecting easy mode will flash the next thing to be collected, or you could just play as a masochist. In the first level you have to collect the parts to build the coffin. And on the second screen, rather like the first game, it changes to something different. Lots of nice sprites here, and the sound is good. All in all, this is a great game, and very reminiscent of Frankenstein. Well, it would be, wouldn't it? What a fantastic game. Sentinels was released by Century City in 1984, and it's a game of three halves. Let me explain. There are a few anomalies with this game, so let's start with the inlay. Initially, one claimed 16 and 48k compatible, and then another only said 48k compatible. Hmm, so which is it? Surely they didn't change the game. The top file has two programs on it, and sure enough, one is for 16k. However, there are really three games here. All will be revealed. First, the 16k version then. Upon loading it, you are asked if you want to view the instructions. If you say yes, you get the instructions and then the game. If you say no, you go straight to the game. When you get to the game, weirdly, there's no user-definable graphics at all. It looks like a colorized ZX81 game. Before I get to the gameplay, let's try out the 48k version. Loading this, again we are asked if we want to see the instructions. We've already seen them, so let's say no. Ugh, what a mess. Something's wrong here. Reloading and answering yes if you want to read the instructions, and the game looks very different. And then I notice the inlay. Inside, stamped on is a message stating that you must press yes to read the instructions before you play the game. How strange. Moving to the game then, and we've seen this sort of thing many, many times before. Aliens drop down in columns. When once the column fills up, they start to drop down towards your ship. If they hit the ground, they explode by three columns, so you can't get too close. There are two other aliens at each side, and if they turn red, it means they're about to obliterate you, unless you can shoot them first. And if you don't get there, you lose a life. Now the graphics are all user-defined, and move in 8 pixels. Sound is simple beeps, and although there's a tiny bit of gameplay here, I don't really think it's worth the $1.99 asking price. I have no idea why the 16K version did not have graphics, I mean, they don't take up any more RAM. A quick note to websites then, the screen you are showing for the game is not really the right one. 
time to move on. <laughs>